Good evening, and welcome to our uh, Wednesday evening Bible study and prayer. We are glad that you are with us this evening, and um, we just want to, uh, first of all, thank our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for allowing us to see another day. I want to give out kudos to uh, my brother in Christ, uh, Ray Sean Yancey, for taking us through last week's lesson in Daniel chapter 5. Um, I was out of town at my uh, wife's family reunion in Georgia, and it, it went very well. Uh, the family is all doing well, and it was just great to see some, uh, some of the family that we had not seen because of the pandemic, and so it was our first time really getting together in a while. So uh, again, I want to thank Ray Sean Yancey for, for the work that he has done. Um, we will be in Daniel chapter 5, verses 13 through the end of the chapter today. We hope to be able to get through that. Um, but as always, we want to begin uh, our study and our lesson today with, uh, with prayer. You know, there's many things that uh, Christians can't do. But one thing Christians can do is pray. And God has called us to pray daily. We are to uh, be in an attitude of prayer. Paul said to pray continually. So that means to be in an attitude of prayer. So that's really what, what, what we should be doing. And that's why we begin every uh, Wednesday evening Bible study with prayer. Not only for um, intercessory prayer, but to praise and give glory to our Lord and Savior for keeping us another day. So with that said, for those that are here this evening, and again, we encourage you, when the weather is still nice, where the weather is still good, to come on out to Wednesday evening Bible study, and of course, Wednesday afternoon Bible study at noon. So do we have any prayer requests or any praise reports uh, before we go before the throne of grace? Elder Brown, let's um, want to pray for the uh, family of Harris, uh, Sweetie Pa Harris, who passed away. want to pray for her daughter, uh, Darmita, and the family, her sister, Faye, and the, the rest of the family. Amen. And that's uh, in the passing? That's uh, for? Mary Harris. We call Mary. her Sweetie Pa. Okay. Also, Keith Adams, continue to keep him in prayer. And the Adams family, I think they lost uh, another a brother here in the last few days. Amen. Also, keep my wife in prayer. Um, she lost her nephew. Uh, he passed last Tuesday, and his, he was funeralized down in Georgia on Monday. So uh, keep Cherry uh, in, in your prayers. She is still down there, and of course, that God would grant her uh, traveling mercies to return home safely. That would be the Jackie Kimball family. Jackie Kimball was, uh, was her nephew's uh, name. Okay, are there any others? All right. But with that, let's go before the throne of grace. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O Lord, my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Father, your name is great and greatly to be praised. As we've sung in this church for so many uh, years and so many times, you are a way maker a miracle worker, a promise keeper, light in the darkness. We praise you because there is none like you in all of the universe. It was you who created the universe and everything that is within it. We praise you because you keep everything under control. And even though it appears to be chaotic, we know that you are in the ultimate control. Nothing happens that catches you off guard. 
So we praise you, Lord, for your, your keeping power. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, was buried, and you raised him from the dead on the third day, and he lives forevermore with all power over death, hell, and the grave. We praise you for sending your Holy Spirit to live within each and every believer. We thank you for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit in our lives that he tells us no, that he tells us to move forward. Father, our prayer is, is that we would listen to what the Spirit has to say. We praise you, Lord, for the abundance that you've given us, how you've granted us our right minds, transportation, food, clothing, shelter, how you provided necessary finances, Lord, to meet the needs not only of this local church, but to meet our needs as well, to take care of those obligations that we incur every day. We thank you for entrusting us being good stewards of that of which you have provided. We praise you because you know what is going to take place. We praise you, Lord, for stopping World War III from happening right now. We praise you for your mercy and your grace. The psalmist wrote, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but until thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. So we thank you for the truth of your word, the Holy Scriptures, the Bible. We thank you for giving us a blueprint for how we should live our lives each and every day. But Father, we can't begin to ask you anything without first of all realizing that perhaps we've missed the mark today. We've said some things, we've done some things, we've been out of whack. In other words, Lord, we've sinned and fallen short of your glory. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Cleanse us. We come before you right now, Lord, saying that we're sorry. We ask that you would give us another opportunity. You said that if we would confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And all still means all, Lord. So we thank you for that. So pick us up, clean us up, put us back on the path. And Father, Strengthen us so that the sin that so easily besets us would no longer be a stumbling block. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. And so, Father, we thank you for cleansing us right now. We ask for your forgiveness. Lord, during this time of intercessory prayer, we thank you for answered prayer. We thank you that the Hostage situation in Austin Town turned out okay. No one was killed. We praise you for that. We thank you on the praise report that uh, Kira and Dennis's son, Kaysen, the surgery went well. We praise you for that. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for the praise report that Bob Dabney continues on the men. Deacon John Klinkscale continues on the mend. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for these men. We thank you for these answered prayers. Father, we bring before you the, the Harris family and the loss of their loved one. We ask that you would comfort them, Father, as only you can. We pray that the life of that loved one would be so impactful that others would come to Christ in that family. We also pay for Keith Adams and the comfort in their family as well, and the loss of their loved one. We pray for our sick and shut-in, Joyce Callens, Betty Brown, Pam Clardy, and others, Lord, who are, who are sick and need a touch from you. 
May Stewart, Brother Ferguson's brother Leonard, Mary Taylor, who's in hospice, a nine month old baby who needs brain surgery. We pray for the a woman who was involved in the standoff, Lord, that you would touch her even right now. Heal her mind, Lord. Cure her as only you can. We pray for our own Jennifer Hightower. You know her struggles. You know what is going on with her. We pray, Father, that you would touch her even right now. Terry Wilkie, who needs a heart transplant. We continue to lift up Kena Pugh and Gwen Saunders and DeAndre, Art and Nikki Carter, Mark and Tam Brown. Tam is back in the hospital, Lord. So, Father, I pray that you would just touch my sister-in-law even right now and that the doctors would be able to find out what is causing the problems of which she must remain hospitalized. We pray for Linda. We pray for the leadership here at Rising Star Baptist Church. We pray, Father, that you would raise up leaders that would be able to continue this ministry that you started. We pray, Lord, for our pastor and his heart, his desire to serve. Thank you for giving him a shepherd's heart. Thank you for his commitment to not only his family, but to this community. Give him the wisdom and knowledge he needs, Lord, on the school board to make it right for our children. Lord, we also lift up those who are returning from vacation. Grant them traveling mercies. Allow them to find their homes in the same condition as they left it. Father, you know about the situation with the abortion issue. You were the one who declared what took place. And Father, unfortunately, it continues to divide this nation. And Father, you've always said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. So Father, the saints must rally together to pray and to lift up our nation. And that's what we're doing right now. Bind us together, Lord. Help us, Father. We pray for our new members and visitors. We pray for the continuing situation in Europe between Russia and Ukraine. Father, you know how that's going to turn out. We pray that you would spare as many lives as possible. We pray that you would save as many as possible. We pray for our own Mamie Ashley. Touch her body, Lord. We pray for those grandparents that are raising their grandkids. Help them, Father, as only you can. We pray for our school board again. We pray for our president, our governor, and of course the mayor of this great city, our brother in Christ, Tito Brown. Lord, give him the wisdom that he needs in order to effectively govern this particular city. Let him seek you daily in every decision that he makes. And Father, for those unspoken requests that have gone out, we pray that you would answer them as only you can. It is so wonderful when you say yes, Lord, but it's, it's a, a test for us when you say either no or wait. So, Father, give us the patience. Give us the long suffering to see your will played out. And now, Lord, bless our lesson today as we continue to look at Daniel. We thank you for his faithfulness that's penned within the words of the Bible. But Father, we hope to draw some lessons out today that we can apply in our very lives. Thank you for again for the Holy Spirit who makes all of this possible. Thank you for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who makes prayer possible that we can boldly come before the throne of grace and make our requests known unto you. We thank you, we love you, and of course we praise you. For in the name of Jesus, we ask all of these things. Amen. Amen.
Well, good evening. And it's good to see everybody out this evening. So let us go right to where we're going to be today for those who are following us on the internet. We are in Daniel chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. And we hope to get through all 31 uh, verses today. Actually, it's 18 verses. And I pulled out some lessons that I want us to, uh, to, to try to apply this evening. So hopefully, we'll be able to get through that. Last week, Brother Rayshon took us through uh, Daniel 5, verses 1 through 12. And we see Belshazzar at the feast. And he was having this feast because he thought that he was, uh, uh, like his grandfather, he thought he was okay. He thought that you know, nothing was going to take place. Babylon was in a good place. They had food reserved for up to 20 years. They had thick walls. The Euphrates River ran right through the city. They had everything that they needed. Even though they were under attack by the Medes and the Persians, Belshazzar said, no, he says, we're going to have a party. And so they began to party. And as they began to party, they said, you know what? Let's bring out those vessels that my grandfather took from the temple back in Jerusalem when we ransacked Jerusalem and took captives. Let's drink from these vessels of gold and, and, and let's praise our gods for giving us the victory. And as we read, of course, as they were partying, suddenly a handwriting began, began writing on the wall. A hand appeared and began writing on the wall. And of course, this shook everybody up. In fact, I'm sure Rayshon pointed out that Belshazzar was shaken to his very knees. He was, he was greatly fearful, and who wouldn't be? Who wouldn't be? And then, of course, we, we read down, and just like his grandfather, he says, I need to call my boys in to see w what this is all about. And, of course, we've seen the first time <laughs> When Nebuchadnezzar was king, when he had a dream that no one could interpret it from his boys, the soothsayers, the diviners, the Chaldeans, and God showed himself strong by giving Daniel the interpretation not only of the dream, but what the dream meant. Then, of course, we read in, in, in chapter 4 that Nebuchadnezzar had another dream. And again, he called his boys, the diviners, the soothsayers, the Chaldeans, and they could not give him an answer. And God again blessed David and Dave, or Daniel, and Daniel gave the interpretation of that particular uh, dream. And in that situation, Nebuchadnezzar, after seeing what God had done in the first dream, what God had delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace, how God had interpreted the second uh, dream that he had, and everything in that dream came to pass, including Nebuchadnezzar's seven years of insanity. And Nebuchadnezzar ended up praising the Most High God at the end of chapter 4, where he said in verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. I want you to circle that last portion. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. Well, Belshazzar, A, either did not learn from his grandfather, or B, did not care to learn from his grandfather, or C, was not told what took place. Daniel is going to refute that as, as we read through here. But Belshazzar was filled with the same pride as his grandfather. And it took his grandmother, the queen, to come in and say, look, you are wasting your time with these diviners, these soothsayers, these Chaldeans, these people who supposedly, you are wasting your time. 
but there is a man. And that's the beautiful part about God. He always has a he always has someone at the ready. But he says, but there is a man, she says, and King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. Why? Because he had an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems. His name is Daniel. His Babylonian name is Belteshazzar, which means lady protect the queen or the king. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. And that's what we pick up today in verse 13. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, and I like this. This is the height to me of arrogance. Are you that Daniel, who was one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father, the king, brought before Judah. Now, think about that. Are you the Daniel? Did not his grandmother say, this is the Daniel? Was not he ruler over a third of Babylon for all of these years? Was his fame not known throughout Babylonia? The answer is yes. But Belshazzar said, no. He said, I'm really the guy. But are you this Daniel of the Gentiles from Judah? Now, I've heard about you and that you have a spirit, look, spirit of the gods, lowercase, in you. And that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. Verse 15, just now the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me that they might read this inscription and make its interpretation known to me, but they could not declare the interpretation of the message. Look at verse 16. But I personally, this is, this is the height of arrogance, but I personally have heard about you. <laughs> that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you are able to make the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, the kingdom, actually, Babylonia, was actually ruled by N Nabonidus. His son is Belshazzar. So you have he, Nabonidus, was actually the king. But he turned over ruling of the city of Babylon to his son, Belshazzar. So Belshazzar says, if you can interpret this, you will be third in command. A Jew in Babylon. An exile taken from Jerusalem. God raises up who he chooses to raise up. Now, Belshazzar, if he has studied his family's history, should have known this. Now, let's take a look at what Daniel had to say about all of this. I like his answer in verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, like, keep your gifts. He said, keep your gifts for, for, for yourself or give them to someone else. Now that's pretty bold language when you are before the king. Now the king is promising you all of this great stuff and you say, <laughs> I don't want your stuff, king. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I will give you the interpretation. Mm -hmm. But before he gives the interpretation, he comes down hard on Belshazzar. And this is what he said. He says, O oh, king, the most High God, my God, granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, look at this, all the peoples, nation, and men of every tongue, 
language, feared and trembled before him. Look at the power God granted him. Whomever he wished, he killed. And whomever he wished, he spared alive. And whomever he wished, he elevated. And whomever he wished, he humbled. Now, why do you think he is painting this particular picture to Belshazzar? Anybody want to take a guess? Now, as you recall, I don't ask difficult questions. So this is, this, this is, this is an easy one. Why do you think he spent this time before the interpretation of giving him this lesson, Rayshon? Um, it could be him highlighting a previous pattern that his father before him engaged in too and then letting him know how that ended for his, his ancestor. That is one reason. Sister Donna. To, so, to show who the true sovereign was. To show who the true sovereign was. To remind Belshazzar what his father did when confronted with the Most High God. My boy repented and gave praise to the Most High God. And, well, let's just go back and see what he had to say. Let's go back to chapter 4, verse 34. And we're going to pull down at when he says this. For his, well, he says, the Most High and I praise and honor him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. But he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and no one emphasize no one can ward off his hand or say to him what have you done that's what happens when you repent that's what happens when you are confronted with the most high God Belshazzar apparently didn't learn that lesson so Daniel had to remind him about who we're dealing with here. As Donna said, we're dealing with the Most High God. We're dealing with the sovereign of the universe. Verse 20. But when his heart was lifted up, his being Nebuchadnezzar, but when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he, began, that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne, and his glory was taken away from him. Warning, pride goes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. But he, but he doesn't stop there. He was also driven away from mankind, and his heart was made like that of beast, and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until, circle that, he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. He is laying the groundwork for Belshazzar. Look, you need to repent like your father did. You need to recognize that the Most High God sets up all of this. There's a time that the Gentiles will rule over God's people, and there will be a time where God will end that. He is the Most High God. But look at verse 27, or verse 22. Yet you his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. That's the point I wanted to get to. Belshazzar is up there lying and said, I didn't know anything about this. I didn't know anything about my, my grandfather going crazy. I didn't know anything about him praising the Most High God. I didn't know anything about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I didn't know anything about... Uh, you, Daniel, interpreting 
grandpa's dreams twice. He lied because of his pride. Because Daniel says, even though you knew all this. Daniel accused Belshazzar of pride. He desecrated the vessels from God's temple. And he was an idolater. Look at verse 23. But you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. Mm. And they have brought the vessels of his house before you. And you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines have been drinking wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand. So he has laid out the charges against Belshazzar. He has given him an opportunity to say, man, I've messed up. I'm going to fess up so I don't have to pay the penalty. But the God in whose hand are your life breath and your ways you have not glorified. Let me point out something here. Notice what he says here. The God in whose hand holds your life and you have not praised him. You see, we've run into the same problem when we don't recognize that it is God who holds us in his hand. We used to sing that song when we were little, hold to his hand, God's unchanging hand. But until you accept Christ as Savior, you don't really grasp exactly what that means. It means that he is in control. He knows exactly how much time you have. And he knows the expiration date. You see, God knows the expiration date for everyone in this room and everyone listening to me via the Internet. He knows when it's going to end. And you know what? There's nothing that you can do about it. That's one appointment everyone will keep who breathes on this planet. So then we go to verse 24. Then the hand was sent from him. Notice, he says, this is who sent the hand to write this on the wall. The most high God, the sovereign of the universe, the one who holds your very life in his hand. He says, this is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, abharsin. So we're going to break that down. And he breaks it down and tells us what the problem is. Mene, mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Notice, that is the only word that is repeated twice. Mene, mene. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. And then he repeated it, in case you didn't get it the first time. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Then he says, take hell. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. You're too light. (laughs) You're too light. The scales are like this. And you're down here. You're too light. You cannot balance the scales. And then he says, Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the the Persians. It should be observed that every, that each word stands for a short sentence. Mene signifies numeration. Tekel, T-E-K-E-L, signifies weighing, W-E-I-G-H-I-N-G, and Perez, division. So in a nutshell, it says this, God had Belshazzar's number. 
<laughs> and it fell short. God weighed Belshazzar. Okay, let's put it on the scales. Let's see if the scales are balanced. <laughs> he came up light. Therefore, God would divide Belshazzar's kingdom to the Medes and the Persians. History tells us this. A mighty army and bringing tactics overcame the Babylonian Empire, yet it still fell from within. And if we take a look at history all the way through, from Alexander the Great to Babylon to Greece to Rome, all fell from within. Spiritual and moral depravity weakened the foundation of those nations to the point where they were overtaken. And that's what happened. Even though, as I said, history shows that the Medes and Persians developed a brilliant strategy, history shows that, as I said, the Euphrates River ran right through Babylonia. But the Medes and the Persians diverted that river to a nearby pond or swamp, allowing the soldiers, the Medes and the Persians, to walk underneath the gates, these thick gates. Now, to show you the arrogance of Belshazzar, the gates weren't locked. So the Medes and the Persians just came on in, into the city, and we read it was a bloodless coup. They took over without having to destroy anything. Who do you think was responsible for that? Now she's got a mic. They were actually having this drunken party. That's right. They were already, and he knew they were. That's correct. But he thought that his walls were so fortified that they couldn't even penetrate them. That's right. So could you imagine knowing there's enemies around your house, and then you go and get drunk and act like they aren't out there? And that's what he did. So, and that's why God said, this night, your kingdom is your done. Your kingdom is done. The height of arrogance is this. When we think that we know more than God, that's the height of arrogance. When we think that we can outsmart the one who created us, that is the height of arrogance. When we think we can tell the one who created us and sustains us every day that he doesn't know what he's doing, that is the height of arrogance. Belshazzar has the nerve to throw a party when the enemy is all around him. Instead of saying the enemy is around us, we should prepare ourselves for battle, he says, no, I got this. I got walls three feet thick, not a problem. I got the Euphrates flowing through. They can't get through the Euphrates and through the sluice gates. That's an impossibility. In fact, to show you that it's an impossibility, I'm not even locking up the gates. I'm leaving the gates open because there's no, and don't forget our moat system that we have around there, M-O-A-T. All these things where you got to try to go through water eight, nine foot deep. There is no way the enemy can get us. So let's party. Donna. So was there a different kind of pride or was it just that God grants mercy on who he gives mercy because Nebuchadnezzar was extremely arrogant he, he looked at himself as the sovereign absolutely yet God dealt with him and gave him time and more time and still at the same time allowed him to keep his kingdom reestablished him and gave him back his sovereignty, his rulership. But the grandson, no slack, nothing. I think it was a different, to answer your question, I think it's yes to both. The sovereignty of God 
and the fact that Belshazzar did not do what his grandfather did. Repent. You see, even though, and, and, and you know this as well as I do, after the second interpretation of the dream, a whole year passed. And then, of course, Nebuchadnezzar decided to walk out on his veranda, looking at his beautiful hanging gardens, and says, Oh, Babylon, Babylon, that I have created. He couldn't even finish the sentence. And then what Daniel had predicted took place. I think in Belshazzar's case, I think his arrogance was, 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 was more than, than his grandfather's. He didn't even think about, there wasn't even any attempt to think about repenting. And so God had to deal with him and deal with him harshly. I, I think God can do whatever he wants to do. That, He's that sovereign. But it seems like God is a little bit more quick to, to exercise judgment when you know better. Here in 22. Yes. Yet you, his son, Belshazzar, mm -hmm. have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. You knew all of this. And so, you know, I'm just looking at me. <laughs> Amen. When we look at a passage like this, we can be hard on the characters and forget how much we know. In fact, how much more we, we know, know than they knew Preach. because of progressive <laughs> revelation. And so this is just, just extremely humbling when and he, and he goes on to say, because you didn't, uh, in verse 24, mm -hmm. in what you have not glorified. You have not glorified it. And so, so many times we, we don't glorify God the way he needs to be glorified. Amen. And he can respond in the same way and would be just in doing so. Amen. And who can say, what have you done? The thing that struck me also about this, in the, the fact that he also knew all of this, is that he lied about it. He said he didn't know who this, he says, are you this Daniel? Now, come on. That's like saying, do you know Pastor Donaldson? Are you Pastor Donaldson? Of course I know that's Pastor Donaldson. And it's the same situation right here. Are you the Daniel who was brought in with the exiles from my grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, the king? Now, first of all, the queen had already told him that Daniel, this was the Daniel. So not only was he arrogant up to this point, partying when his kingdom was about to fall, but he knew all of these facts about what had taken place beforehand. God had revealed himself mightily, and he knew this, yet it didn't make any bother to him. He was trusting in his own army and ability and not giving any glory to the Most High God. See, I think that's where we fail. We fail when we don't give God glory, when we don't give God praise for who he is and for what he's done. That is our problem because Jesus told us how we ought to pray. And we recite the Lord's Prayer all the time, but do we really listen to those words when we recite the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. That's the first thing. First thing out of that, holy is your name, O oh Lord. Or do we just say, Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. Lord, I want this. Lord, give me that. We don't spend any time praising the one who is responsible for us being alive. 
Sister Blonda. And the part of it that's so striking to my heart is how they blaspheme God's holiness. Yes. And the things that he set apart for himself. And then they would just, because of pride and drunkenness, <laughs> just take those very things that God had set apart and, you know, and then worship other, the gods of gold and silver. And, and stone. And that was like a slap right in God's face. So, but it challenges me that, so how do you reverence his holiness? Sister Jerry. Um, he was so arrogant that his enemies, he didn't think that they would have the nerve to even attack him. He was so confident in the fact that he was all that. That's right. What person seeks to protect his house and leave the doors wide open thinking that nobody's going to come in? What type of intelligence is that? We, put it, we open the doors, put it aside, come in here if you think you can handle me. Come, come on in here. How many of us got a sign like that in our house? The answer is no one. But pride will do that. So we go to verse 29. Then Belshazzar gave orders. I'll have to give it up to Belshazzar. He, he lived up to his promise. And they clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that he now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. But I like verse 30. That same night... Belshazzar the Chaldean king was slain. So Daniel didn't have much time to be the third in command <laughs> of the kingdom of Babylon because it was no longer <laughs> under that person's control. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. So fame was fleeting. But Daniel didn't care anyway. He says, look, you need to give that to someone else. I don't even care about that. So what I was able to do, and this is going to cause us to have interaction until we close out tonight, I picked out five lessons based upon my study in, in this book right here, as I said before, and I strongly urge you to get it, The Daniel Dilemma, How to Stand Firm and Love Well in a Culture of Compromise by Chris Hodges. Five lessons, and we're going to talk about these briefly, and I hope everybody has a chance to participate. The first thing that I learned is that our days are numbered. Somebody get me Hebrews 9, 27, and then someone get me Psalm chapter 90, verses 9 and 10. Psalms chapter 90, verses 9 and 10. Okay. Sister Donaldson is going to hook us up with that. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Uh, cut on the mic. You should see a green dot. You have to hold the mic to your mouth, though, sister. <laughs> okay. 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 Psalms 90, verses 9 and 10. It says, for all our days out here in this wilderness, says Moses, pass away in your wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told, for we adults know we are doomed to die soon without reaching Canaan. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, seventy years, or even if by reason of strength, fourscore years, eighty years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. It is soon cut off and we fly away. But I would just like to add something here. Yes, ma'am. You know... 
In Psalms 139, it says, all our days are numbered in, a, in our book. God has a book on every human being that has ever been born on planet Earth. Yes, ma'am. And he keeps a record of all that we do. And of course, in that book is also written our destiny. And he wants us to find out what is there and want us to carry it out for the time that he leaves us here on earth. And uh, you know, Daniel was, uh, I guess, a slave, you say? But he served under all these uh, different uh, kings and kings. governments. Mm -hmm. And how that God elevated that man, even though he faced, um, you know, severe trials and all this kind of stuff. But he was God's man, bearing, being a witness there in captivity. And so, you know, God can use us wherever he places us. Amen. And that just impresses me so much about Daniel. And I don't think he ever went back to um, his never home. Went back, he never went no, back to Jerusalem. No. He was there, I guess, up in, into his 80s. Yes. But he served in all, on all these different, uh, I guess you said governments. Right. Yeah, heathen people. But God had a witness there in Babylon. Amen. Amen. We must not waste our lives. This is what Chris Hodges said. When we recognize our limitations, we tend to make the most of our lives. You know, that great prophet Clint Eastwood once said in a movie, a man has got to know his limitations. And we have to know that. God is infinite. No beginning, no end. We are finite. We have a beginning and we have an end. So we must not waste our lives. Hebrews 9, 27. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. After this comes judgment. It is appointed unto man to die. So unless the rapture takes place and we are caught up to be with him in, in the heaven, we will perish. Now, this is just something that, that, that will happen. The reason that we mourn so is because, A, many times we know, A, that the person who has perished does not know the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we know where that person is going to go. Another reason we mourn is because we're human. We have lived with this person or persons for years. And even though we knew that they were going to perish, it still comes as a shock in some cases. So that is why we must redeem the time because the scripture says the times are short. Yeah, really quick, I just want to throw this out. There is now what's called a gospel of inclusion. Um, one of the proponents of uh, someone pushing that theology is Carlton Pearson. And I'm saying that just so you, um, when you hear it, you won't be quick to embrace it because it's heresy. And basically, the gospel of inclusion says that basically everybody goes to heaven even if they reject Christ. Well, That's heresy. That is, that is heresy. I don't care who's saying it. That, that is heresy. So be advised, whenever you hear something called the gospel of inclusion, it's heresy. Because the scriptures are quite clear how we enter glory. To be the person God has called you to be, Pastor Hodges says this, we must stand apart from the chaotic culture that we live in. We must live for our God, and we need to heed his message contained in his word. That's three of the ways that we can 
learn how to live in a culture of chaos when our days are numbered. Stand apart from the culture. Live for your God and heed his message contained in his word. Number two, choose to live every day with a sense of purpose and urgency. Pastor Hodges says every year at his church in Alabama, they have what's called a 30-day series. And he asked them this question. If you had 30 days to live, how would you spend those 30 days? And I began to reflect on that myself. What would you do? What would you give up? Who would you talk to? It's, a, it's an interesting exercise, but we have to remember that our priorities have to be front and center every day. And what are our priorities? What matters most is what you're doing for God's kingdom. That's the primary responsibility of every believer. What are you doing to enhance the kingdom? That's priority number one. Jesus himself told us this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 33. So let's run over there. Most of us know, of course, Matthew 6, 33, but I want to go to a couple of verses before that. This is Matthew chapter, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And it says this. This is from the NASB. Do not worry then saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. And then, of course, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, food, clothing, shelter, will be added to you. You see, a lot of people take that out of context when they say all these things will be added unto you, and then they begin to add all these other things. The context here is food, clothing, and shelter. God will provide that. So we must remember that order communicates priority. Order communicates priority. Proverbs 3, verse 6 and 9 and 10 tells us about storing up. And it talks about that the passage really deals with money and financial things but the principle is for all things. If we store up those things that God wants and that God has provided, we live our lives with a sense of urgency and purpose. Number three, we need to have a heavenly perspective. We have been told, and it's true, that this is not our final home. God has allowed us through his grace to live on planet Earth. God and his grace has allowed us to live in the United States of America. Now, for all of the United States of America's flaws, and they are many, if you take a look at some of the other countries around the world, where would you rather live than in the United States of America? That's all I'm saying. But we need to have a heavenly perspective. What did Jesus tell his disciples in John chapter 14? He says, don't be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places or mansions. If it were, I would have told you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul says, it's a win-win situation for me. 
as long as I live and I continue to praise God and do what God has called me to do, leading people to Christ, showing people who the Savior is, it's all good. And when I die, I get to be with my Savior for eternity. It's a win-win situation. That's how we have to look at it, saints. We are in a win-win situation. We can't lose if we keep our faith in Christ. Because look at it this way. Again, if I live my life for Christ and I make a difference, I might get beat up and thrown out, but God gets glory. And if my life is forfeited because of that, I get to spend eternity with Christ in heaven. No more pain, no more suffering, no more tears. It's, 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 it's beautiful. We need to embrace that. You know, from the very beginning, Daniel had an eternal perspective. Yes, he did. And so when he w resolved in his heart that he wouldn't defile himself with the delicacies of the king, I mean, he just was a, he had a, he, when you are tied to the world, chances are you'll compromise. Yes. And that's a lesson we, we could all take home. If we're so tied to the world. And the culture. And the culture. And our comfort you will more than likely compromise. Yes. And when you compromise, it's no good for you. That's what we have to remember. Compromise is no good for us. We have to, we have to resolve ourselves that we're going to do it God's way, no matter what, and it, it may cost us. It may. Even when we go down through Hebrews chapter 11, we read about the miraculous things God did, how he saved that person, how he used that person. But it also says some were drawn and quartered. Some were torn in half, sawn in half. Some, like in Nero, Christians were burned to light up his gardens. Some didn't have any place to dwell. They lived in caves. They had very little clothing. We read about uh, Stephen, who was martyred. We read about how Herod killed James. So, but they all were doing it for the glory of God. And so that's what we have to remember, a heavenly perspective. Number four, we are responsible for how we spend our days. You see, Belshazzar was found wanting because he did not spend his days wisely. He spent his days in arrogance and in denial. And it cost him his life, and it cost him his kingdom. We need thinking based on God's word and not the culture around us. I like, let somebody get me Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 6. I like what Solomon had to say about this. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Verse 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 6. One handful of rest is better than two fists full of labor and striving after wind. It is better to have less of what doesn't matter and more of what does matter. And Brother Hodges used an illustration that he saw at a seminar he attended. He said the presenter had a big vat or big container and he filled this container with gravel and he kept filling it with gravel. And then he took these rocks about the size of his hand and tried to fit the rocks in to the gravel and the rocks didn't fit. Then he took the same illustration. He put the big rocks in first. Then he put the gravel over the top and everything fit. The illustration was this. When we fill ourselves with gravel, these little things that we consider important right now, 
and we don't focus on the priorities, when the priorities come, there's no room. We can't, we can't fit them in. We can't get them in there because it's filled with all of this other stuff. Now, the other stuff is going to be different for everybody in this room and everybody that's listening to me over the internet. For you, maybe it's texting. For others, maybe it's shopping. For others, maybe it's, it's, it's fantasy football to the point that you can't even focus on the game because you're worried about your fantasy team. For others, it could be, uh, you know, going out and, you know, eating dinner three or four days a week, spending all of that money when you got food at home. Whatever the gravel is, is choking down the priorities. So you need to figure out what the priorities are. Well, let's talk about them. The first priority is to worship God all the time. Second priority is family. So if you're married, it's your spouse. If you're single, it's your relationship with Jesus Christ. Third, your children, if you have children. And then it goes all the way down. So you, you pick out whatever the priorities are. And you have to fulfill those first. Then you can fill in the rest with, with the gravel and will all fit. But if stuff gets in there and you can't fit in the priorities, then what good does it do? It is always better to live by God's design, not culture-driven demands. It is always better to live by God's design not culture-driven demands. And finally, number five, we have to focus on those things that will last. Amen. Somebody get me Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, as we get ready to close out. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Yeah, go ahead, Donna. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I have that circled in my Bible with the words, wow, <laughs> on my side note. Paul said that I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ. You see, he focused on things that will last. Our relationship with Christ should be our foremost priority because that will last. Things will change. People will come and go. People who you thought were your friends will come and go. Money will come and go. Everybody in here has owned more than one car in their lifetime. They come and go. We like the new car smell. But after three or four months, it's just another way to get around. We need to focus on things that will last. So the five, again, lessons from Daniel 5, 13 through 31 that I gleaned with the help of Chris Hodges. Our days are numbered. Choose to live every day with a sense of purpose and urgency. Have a heavenly perspective we are responsible for how we spend our days. And number five, focus on those things that will last. See, God has a plan for all of us. That plan is contained in his word. See, not everyone's going to be called to be a teacher. Not everyone's going to be called to be a preacher. Not everyone's going to be called to be a leader. 
But everyone is called to praise God. Everyone is called to be concerned for his fellow man, especially the household of faith. Everyone is called to pray. Everyone is called to talk to God. Everyone is called to read the scriptures. The Bereans searched the scriptures daily to see those things that Paul was teaching them if, if, if they lined up with the word. The reason that we are so easily deceived is because we don't spend enough time with the Father. So tonight, if you aren't doing that, ask God to help you. You see, that's the beauty. We can ask God to help us, and he'll help us. <laughs> Did he not say, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask, and God will give it to you. But we have to ask believing. Yes, I want to say something here about the Bereans. Okay. You gotta, yeah, like that. That was the name of the, the um, fellowship that I belong to. <laughs> and it was named Berean Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the ladies, she chose that name. And it was said because of... Uh, We've known for searching the scriptures. Now here, you know, you hear a lot of people, they sit by the Old Testament, but I call it the First Testament. And it's also called the First Testament in Hebrews. But what scripture were they searching? They were searching what we call the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I have read where, it's, and when you read the, the sermons, that the apostle preached. They were preaching from the First Testament, That's <laughs> what right. we call the Old Testament. And so, you know, someone has said that 75% of the New Testament are quotes from the, from Old, the Old Testament. Testament. So this whole Bible is important. You said a mouthful. We must spend time in God's word, all of God's word. Now, I'm just going to share this with me, and then we'll get ready to close. The, the hardest book for me in, 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 in the entire Bible is Numbers. It is so long, and it is so meticulous as you go through the generation. And Jahab begat Buha, and Buha begat Masakaka. You know, names we can't even pronounce. Worse than the, some of the names that are out there today. But it's all important. It leads to a point. It leads to telling you about your father and how much he cares about you. And the proof of that is that he sent his son to die for you. Think about it. God wrapped himself up in flesh and dwelt among his creation. That still is one of the most mind-boggling things about Scripture. He came into his own and his own received him not. How that must have hurt him. But you know what? His grace and mercy endures through all generations. David wrote that in many of the Psalms. He loved us that much. So let's take a new stand that we're going to do it God's way. It may cost you, saints. I'm not trying to sugarcoat anything. It may cost you. It may cost you your job. It may cost you friendships. I know I, my stand on, on what God has decided to declare it about abortion I know that's going to cost me at least two or three friendships that I have for 30 years. I know it. Because I got to stand on what thus saith the Lord. So you just have to be prepared. As Paul said, in this life, we are going to suffer persecution if we are doing things for the call of Christ. So let's remember that when we leave here this evening, that God has to be the top priority. We have to do it his way. We, we just have to. And if we do it his way, we will be rewarded. Going back to what Sister Donaldson said about, 
about the Old Testament. God promised his people in, in Deuteronomy and in Leviticus, look, if you do it my way, you will be blessed. But if you don't do it my way, you're going to be cursed. It, it's really, why would he make his stuff so hard that we couldn't understand it? And the answer is he doesn't. He wants us to get it right. And he's given us example after example in both the Old and the New Testament. In the First Testament, New Testament, in the entire Bible, he's given us example after example of people who did it God's way and were blessed, and people who didn't do it God's way and were cursed. We saw one tonight. Belshazzar did not repent. Belshazzar died that very party in that night. Sister Blonda died that night. His kingdom did not last very long. Are there any other questions or comments before we close out tonight? Just in closing, um, go ahead, Anima. You know, it was talking about uh, eternity. Hold that mic. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sometimes when uh, I go to the store, I remember a couple, maybe, maybe about three or four years ago, I was up at the, um, one of the drug stores, and there was this young man there, and I asked him, I said, what do you think about eternity? He says, I don't think about it. And so then after, he got waited on ahead of me, and I got waited on after him. And so then he said to me, he says, you know, that question you asked me, it started me to thinking. And I go out to the grocery store in Hubbard, and the young men that, you know, help carry out your groceries or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I asked them, I said, what do you think about eternity? They said, nothing. So you see, there are people who don't give any thought that there is eternity. And I try to tell them, you know, well, God has a wonderful plan for you. You know, there is heaven and there's a hell. And God does not want you to go there. So you see, as we pass people by, you know, doing our whatever we go or whatever, you know, we need to start asking people questions and saying something to them, you know, about the Lord. Amen. That there is, a, there is a heaven and there is a hell. Amen. Pastor, last word before we close out. Just want to read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. He says, Suffer hardships with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus, verse 4. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. We're in a war. And uh, Satan is trying to take as many with him as possible. He doesn't care. He cannot possess believers but he can't oppress believers. And if we are not read up, prayed up, studied up, we can, we can be a casualty. We can be a casualty. So let's not be a casualty. Lord willing, we will be in Daniel chapter 6, one of the great chapters again of God's deliverance, Daniel in the lion's den. So that's where we'll be next week. So please read Daniel chapter 6 in your Bible reading this week. And uh, let's get our hearts and minds set for worship on Sunday. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the word. We thank you for the lessons that we've learned today, how we need to have a heavenly perspective, how we need to number our days, how we need to set our priorities straight. Father, thank you for giving us these lessons. Thank you for uh, the word of God. Thank you for the example that Daniel set. He had a heavenly perspective. He was determined that he would follow your way no matter what it cost him. And Father, as we draw closer to your return, we're going to need more men and women who have the spirit of Daniel, who are going to be willing to stand no matter what and let you take care of that for us. 
Father, grant us traveling mercies as we leave here this evening and allow us to arrive back to our homes safely. And Father, let us prepare our hearts for worship. And as you give us opportunities between now and Sunday, as Sister Emma said, Lord, let us be ready to ask that question. What do you know about eternity? Where will you go when you die? And let us be prepared to share the gospel. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done in our lives that you continue to do. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and good night.